you ever taken one of those online quizzes to find out, you know, things like which Harry Potter character are you or which friend are you or so forth? And, and you answer a bunch of personality questions and behavioral questions and they tell you, you are Ron or you are Hermione or whatever. You know, do you ever do the same thing with leadership? Do you ever wonder, who am I as a leader? Let me take this quiz and find out what my leadership style is. Well, you know, it's not necessarily that simple. We tend to categorize leadership styles into these distinct silos. But truthfully, we may have one dominant style, but we typically good leaders will pull from others depending on the need. But, um, but even so, I want to spend a few minutes talking about leadership styles and the, and the generalized leadership style categories that we have, just so we have an understanding of of where different leaders are coming from and, and how uh, different leadership tasks might be performed. So uh, with that in mind, let's start with author authoritarian leadership. Authoritarian leadership says, I am in charge. Uh, that authoritarian leader says, you are following me. I set the tone. I set the stage. And, uh, and everybody else falls in line behind that. So authoritarian leadership, some of the different qualities that may exist in there is that it's a traditional top-down hierarchy. It's one person at the top giving directions, giving orders, and setting the, the standard and everybody else falling in line then. Uh, it's one person who defines the objectives for the organization or for the team and then issues the marching orders for how they're going to get there. So that person is not only setting the, the vision and the mission, uh, but they're also determining how they're going to get there and who's going to do what on the way. It is very efficient in terms of time constraints. If you have a, if you have a limited amount of time to complete a project or to accomplish a goal, then authoritarian leadership can be really effective in that regard because it is less time consuming. There's not a lot of hemming and hawing over making decisions and things. That person makes a decision and everybody else follows it. So if you have a very short amount of time and you're under a time constraint, then authoritarian leadership can be effective in that regard. It does provide clear guardrails. It does let people know here is your lane, stay within it. And here's what I'm instructing you to do. And, and these are your tasks and that's it. So it does provide very clear guardrails for people too. And, and some people appreciate that and need that. Um, so um, authoritarian leadership can be effective in those regards. So uh, let's take a look at each of these. We'll take a look at the you know, pros and cons positives and negatives of each of these leadership styles. Let's start with a positive column for authoritarian leadership. First of all, again, it's very efficient decision making. There's not a lot, a lot of times there's not a lot of conversation. That person may ask for input or whatever, but in the end, they can make a decision as quickly as needed because they're the only one who's making that decision. So decision making is very efficient. There's a very defined chain of command. There's no question about who's in charge, who's making decisions, um, who you should take orders from, who's responsible for what, because that person is identifying all of those things. Uh, again, along those same lines, your task assignments are clear. If that person tells you to do something, you do it. If they don't, then you don't do it. You know, that's it. That's the task assignments. Um, uh, it's very clear cut. And it does create uh, at times consistent results. You have one person in charge of things and other people following along. So you get the same thing every time. So if you're trying to keep the status quo, then that's good. You get consistent uh, results over time. On the con side, the followers may resist or revolt in, in this whole thing because they may not like being told what to do. They may not like that uh, ruler you know, of, with an iron fist over them, right? So they could re resist or revolt against that type of leadership. Um, it does stifle the creativity and innovation of the followers. It doesn't allow for that. Only the leader is allowed to, to really uh, set the, the tone and, and come up with new things. And, and the, your job is not to come up with new things. Your job is to do whatever that leader tells you to. So it does stifle the creativity and innovation of the followers. It really limits group input. Uh, again, they may ask for some input, but, but the truth is they're going to make that decision. And so it's much more limited than when you have a more free-flowing conversation. And it tends to increase turnover in organizations like this. Again, you have a handful of people who really appreciate that, uh, that, that, that defined chain of command, those orders on um, people who thrive in the military, for example, really have a respect for authoritarian leadership a lot of times. Um, and so they, they thrive in that situation, but uh, many people in faced with that, uh, that type of leadership, again will tire of it. They'll wear out on it and uh, they'll leave. So it, you do have a higher turnover rate typically when you have somebody who's an authoritarian leader. 
Okay, so pros and cons, authoritarian leadership. Let's move on to the next style of leadership, which is participative leadership. Participative. So here the leader says, I want to hear from you. It's sort of the opposite of authoritarian, right? We got participative leadership. They want people to participate. It says so right in the name, right? A participative leadership is semi-democratic, right? It's it's sort of democratic. It's it's you know features some of that. I want to hear from you. I want your input. I want everybody to have a say. In the end, the the, the leader does typically have the final say, but they're going to be much more inclined to hear everybody out and to, to hear allow people to express themselves fully and to participate in that way. They are intentional. Leaders are intentional here about including others. Uh, if you have somebody who's maybe a little quieter. And that leader will make an effort to pull them in to say, you know, we haven't heard from you yet. Uh, let's, what are your thoughts here? And uh, so they will make an effort and be intentional about including others. Um, they'll also uh, be quite engaging and motivating for the team. This type of leadership style is engaging and motivating for the team uh, because they feel involved. They feel heard. They feel uh, wanted, like the leader respects their input, even if they don't take it necessarily, um, that the leader uh, is interested in hearing what they say and that they have a voice at least. So, uh, however, this can be, I went too far, this can be potentially very time consuming. Right? Hearing all these voices, allowing people to have their say and to fully have their say can be time consuming. You're going to spend more time listening to people go back and forth and decisions won't come as quickly. So um, there are some uh, drawbacks in that regard to the participative leadership. Uh, so let's take a look at some of the pros and cons then. Uh, you do have a higher team motivation and satisfaction. People tend to be more motivated and satisfied when they feel like they have ownership. They feel like they have a voice. Um, so you'll have that as a pro. It does encourage creativity, encourages people to think and to, to express their views and to, to be creative in, in what they're doing. Also increases team cohesion. You're working together more. You're, you're engaging more in this type of leadership with this type of leadership the team is. So um, they're going to be, uh, be more cohesive as a team. They're going to be more connected and together as a team. Uh, there's also a, a, something to be said for the diversity of viewpoints. You're bringing in more voices. Right. Which again can be time consuming, but at the same time, not everybody sees things the same way. So this is going to bring to you different viewpoints and, and give you different perspectives on an issue or on a, on a possible challenge. So um, you're going to get that diversity of viewpoints with this type of leadership style. Uh, on the cons, it does take more time to make decisions. I get you just by virtue of hearing everybody out and, and allowing that, that debate and that discussion to go on longer, you're going to spend more time um, making a decision. So it's not great when in a time sensitive situation, you have your communication channels are less defined because people are communicating across different areas. It's not got that silo effect. So, um, so communication channels become more jumbled and more mixed. Um, so they, they're not necessarily as defined naturally in this type of leadership style. Uh, you also have the weakest leak effect, right? You're as in you're only as strong as your weakest weakest link, right? The chain is only as strong as its weakest link. So your team, if you're depending on everybody's participation and everybody to pitch in and everybody to participate and and uh, to be involved, uh, then you're only going to be as strong as the person who does that the least. You know that's the person who's going to kind of hold you back, and and so you do have that weakest link effect that that comes into play here sometimes with this leadership style. Uh, and then when you have more transparency, that by definition almost really relates to less information security then. If people are uh, aware of more things within the team, they're aware of more information, they're talking about it, and you're encouraging talking about it, then people talk about it and information gets out there. So information security, if that's a priority, can be an issue in a participative uh, leadership uh, situation. Okay, so we got authoritarian. We've talked about participative now. Let's talk about delegative leadership. Delegative leadership. Um, uh, so this is essentially says, I'm trusting you with this. The leader hands things over, says, I'm trusting you with this. I'm, I'm giving this to you. And it's kind of a, what they call a laissez faire um, leadership style, sort of a hands off. And uh, so um, delegative leadership, again, the leader hands out these assignments. The leader determines what the assignments are. They, they give people tasks. They, they uh, assign them chores. They, they uh, give them responsibilities and, and, and things to complete. 
then uh, this does so allow that leader to take advantage of when you have experienced and competent team members. If you've got a good team, if you've got a team with the, that's got solid experience, they're competent, they know what they're doing, then you can. It takes advantage of that experience and that competence and just hands things over to them and allows them to um, take care of things knowing that you don't have to then, right? Because you, you're able to delegate that. This can lead to, I, can, I mentioned this before, these work silos, that were kind of like authoritarian, authoritative leadership. It can lead to these situations where people are only working on their thing, right? They're only working on their thing, so they don't know what's happening in other areas necessarily. Right? The, the, the leader is kind of controlling who does what in these situations. So, so that person may be focused on their own thing and not really aware of what's going on in different areas. So it can, it can kind of create a silo where people aren't necessarily um, working across those uh, channels, um, which again, positives and negatives to that as well, but, but it can lead to these work silos. So pros and cons for this, it leverages the experience and competence of your team, as we mentioned. It does encourage innovation and creativity. It gives people that kind of responsibility and tells them, this is your task, go for it and make it happen. So it does encourage innovation and creativity in that way. It can be individually satisfying. Uh, a person who feels like that per the, the leader is putting their faith in them and giving them you know plenty of room to run with that project can it, that can be individually very satisfying. Um, again, it can be uh, difficult for team cohesion because you're not really working maybe as much with other team members. You're working on just kind of your specific thing, but individually that can be very satisfying and can, and can bring a lot of uh, uh, fulfillment in that way. On the con side, you, these, this type of leadership style can lead to a difficulty when adapting to change. Um, people in, in this type of, uh, of system don't deal with change as well. They're not generally as informed with other areas of the, the organization, and they get used to doing things in their way and get kind of stuck in this mindset. So difficulty to change can be an issue. People can get territorial. When a leader gives them an assignment, it becomes theirs, right? And so then when somebody else has an idea about that or wants to participate, wants to maybe help and get into that, people can become territorial about, no, that's mine. That person gave it to me. It's mine. Um, so territoriality can be an issue. And prioritization might not be clear to the team. If everybody's working on different parts or different pieces, they may not have a sense of, well, where does this fall in terms of you know, what's the most important thing here? What's Which one's going to get the... the the, the most resources. Everybody's going to think, well, mine is the best and needs the most resources. And they may not understand, you know, that prioritization of tasks might not be clear to the team in terms of how resources are allocated and how, uh, how much attention is given to each thing and those types of things. Okay. Uh, authoritative, uh, participative, delegative leadership style. We talked about all those. Let's talk about transactional leadership or what we sometimes call the carrot and the stick model, right? Meaning, uh, you know, the old expression, you, you can motivate a, used to be a donkey, you can motivate a donkey with a carrot or the stick. Either you, you dangle that carrot in front of them with like a reward, or you use the, the stick to kind of, you know, give them, give them a little swat. So they, they do what you want. So, um, not that we're going to do that with our employees or our team members. I'm not encouraging, you know, any kind of corporal punishment or physical, uh, contact whatsoever in that regard. So, but in any case, the carrot and the stick, transactional leadership, meaning there's a transaction, there's, there's an exchange here of some sort happening between the leader and the follower. Um, so when we have the transactional leadership um, happening, um, the leader has the ability to reward and or to punish or to make some other exchange, you know, to give kind of a, a quid pro quo, not in a, again, not, it's usually a lot of times using the sexual harassment. So that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the ability to um, to again, provide reward or punishment on the, on the part of the organization for that employee or that team member. Uh, the leader then sets the goals and the team understands the consequences, positive and negative consequences, right? The, the leader says, this is what we're working toward. This is our quota. This is our, our standard. This is what we're going to achieve. And if the team achieves that, then the team members know that they will be rewarded. And if they don't achieve it, then they know that there may be a punishment. You know, there may be, you know, something negative that would happen as a result, but they understand clearly what those goals are, what that standard is, what, it, and, and what it's going to take to meet that, and then understand what they will, what will happen as a result of that. Uh, the focus here is maintaining the status quo. When we have transactional leadership, it's not about changing things. It's not about development. It's not about innovation. It's about doing things efficiently 
and doing them in kind of the same way over and over again and uh, and doing so as, as best a way as possible. So it's really focused on maintaining the status quo. Positives and negatives for transactional leadership include, uh, first of all, a positive is a goal. Goals are set and understood, and they're very clear. Everybody understands what the goal is, and, uh, and everybody understands what they're working toward. You do see in this situation oftentimes increased motivation and productivity. Uh, people get, get into a rhythm. They get to do the same thing over and over again. They become better at it, so it becomes more productive. Um, that, that motivation comes in the, the idea of a reward you know, a bonus or whatever, if you get to the certain level, uh, it can increase uh, the motivation and productivity of a team. Then there's a very clear chain of command. The leader is setting these things out in transactional leadership. And the leader is the one who has the um, ability to offer rewards and, and allow punishment as needed. Um, so there's a very clear chain of command though. And potentially the members could choose their rewards. Oftentimes, you know, companies will say, well, you know, what would you like as a reward here? Let's, what, what should we work toward? Let's identify something that we can, uh, that would be appealing to, to people that we can work towards. So um, you can maybe even choose those rewards. On the negative side, on the on the con side, you have minimal innovation and creativity. There's not a whole lot going on here. Again, the idea of status quo, it's doing the same thing and doing it efficiently and, and doing it better, but not, not a lot of innovation or creativity going on. There's a low degree of empathy. It's either you, you got it or you didn't. You, you hit that mark or you didn't. There's not a lot of, well, this is why, and let me show you some, well, I understand, so let's give you that reward anyway. No, it's either, did you hit that number or did you not hit that number, so to speak, right? Uh, so there's a low degree of empathy in, in, in this style a lot of times. And there's limited development of leaders within the team. This type of thing, again, doesn't really lend itself to people learning how to lead. They learn how to do their thing over and over again in the best way possible. They don't learn how to lead. They don't learn how to, <coughs> excuse me, grow in the organization and uh, those types of things. So there really is a limited development of leadership within the team. You don't see a lot of growth from within the organization or within the team. Uh, finally, you have what's called transformational leadership, where the leader essentially says, try and see this with me, see it with me, envision this with me. They set that vision and ask people to come along with them. So in transformational leadership, again, the leader casts a vision, they identify a vision, they set that goal, they, they, they identify the mission, then they encourage and empower the team in, in an effort to help them achieve that mission and, the, and that vision. The leader also serves as a role model, though. That's an important aspect of transformational leadership, that the leader um, not only sets that vision, but they you know, set the standard for how to achieve it. They are a role model. They demonstrate the behaviors that are needed to do it. And they, they model those for their employees. And they, you know, so they, they're not just talking the talk, they're walking the walk as well in transformational leadership. Positive negatives here. Uh, it's high on uh, high value on mission or on, on, on vision. Right? That places a really high value on mission, which can be um, really effective and really inspiring for, um, uh, for team members. Uh, it does tend to, to lead to high morale. Uh, people are excited to be involved with this type of leader. If, if I mean, if they stay with it, then they're they're there because they, it's a cause they believe in, a product they believe in, a, a mission that they believe in, and so morale tends to be high when you're uh, working with a transformational leader. It does tend to lead to lower turnover. Again, the people who aren't interested will leave, but those who are will stay, and they will stay uh, for a long time. They will they will you know be better retained than in, with some of these other leadership styles. It does place an emphasis on va and on relationships and values relationships within the organization. It emphasizes the idea of of connecting with those people and and uh, and, and so it does value relationships in that regard. And then it emphasizes um, motivation and inspiration. It's really a transformational leader relies on motivation and inspiration, and they provide those things to their their team members so that those folks will then help them pursue the vision. On the con side, you have the potential for a, it be deception by the leader, right? potential for deception. Transformational leaders uh, pull people in with charisma and they deceive them sometimes. Not all the time, but sometimes, you know, you, you see this in cult leaders and other, other people like that, that where they're, they're leading them, but they're deceiving them at the same time. It does require regular motivation and feedback. It's a constant. It, 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 as a leader, you constantly have to be pouring into that and providing that motivation and providing that feedback and so that you can see the team grow and change and, and improve. 
And it does depend on the buy-in from members. You have to have the buy-in of the group. You can't a transformational leader isn't much of a leader if they don't have anybody following them. So you have to have those people that, that buy into that vision and that mission and then follow along with that. And protocol and regulations can be undefined here as well. Um, again, not, not very clear channels of, or a clear idea of what the guardrails are and who's in charge of what necessarily. And it tends to be a little more fluid, um, which can work well for some people and organizations, but um, for other folks that that's going to be uh, something that's difficult to, to navigate. So again, as I mentioned in a previous video, I hope that you're understanding that, that it's not just any one of these leadership styles really that's important, but it's all of them. It's, it's, you know, how can we pull the best out of all these, in my opinion, the best out of all these to, for that situation and, uh, and, and to become the most effective and appropriate leader that we can in that context, and, um, because leadership really does pull on a lot of different things. It's not just any one thing leadership uh, is, is draws on and depends on a variety of different things for effectiveness. So, um, so we should do the same thing and pull from these as we can and, and understand them so that we can pull from them as we can and as we need. If you have questions about communication and leadership, please feel free to email me and be happy to chat with you um, there. And in the meantime, I hope that you will really uh, think about and reflect on these different styles of leadership and which one might work for you the most and then how you can pull from the others to really round out your own leadership ability.